Why is singing such an important part of our getting together as church? Some of us sing aloud with the hymns in the live streamed services, some in household groups and some alone and some watch and sing in our hearts but aren't singing out loud as we might have enjoyed in the past in church and look forward one day to doing again. Even so, I think our services would lose a lot if we didn't include songs of praise. And that's why it would be a difficult balance when we get the opportunity to start meeting in church without singing. Uh, we're, there's as much, there's something to lose in that as well as the gain from a physical meeting of a few. Christians have always sung whenever they get together, right from New Testament times when the Lord Jesus followed the Old Testament Jewish practice of singing hymns with his disciples. Why? In the last few weeks of looking at Isaiah's prophecies, we've seen some tough messages of judgment for those who set themselves against the Lord. We're completing now this focus on the second section of Isaiah from chapters 13 through to 27. We haven't read every verse in that section, but we've tried to get a flavour of all of it and read most of it. The most chilling chapter is probably the one we've just skipped over, chapter 24, where Isaiah looks beyond the judgment on the nations around him in the coming years to the final judgment on the whole earth. Everything that makes human life sustainable and enjoyable is systematically destroyed. We may spot echoes in the environmental destruction going on now, but the picture in Isaiah 24 is more devastated than Greta Thunberg's worst nightmares. And yet, even as Isaiah foresees this big judgment with his long range eschatological goggles on, can you guess what he hears? Look at chapter 24, verse 16. From the ends of the earth, we hear singing. Glory to the righteous one. This singing comes from a faithful remnant when the rest of the world have rebelled against God and are judged. It's a major theme in the book of Isaiah as a whole that there is a remnant who in chapter 24 verse 13 are like the few grapes left still on the vine after the harvest. In verse 14, they raise their voices and shout for joy. What have they got to sing and shout about? In chapters 25 and 26, we hear more of the content of their songs and shouts of praise. Chapter 25, verses 1 to 9, Isaiah gives us some reasons to praise God. So I'm going to work through just those nine verses and give some pointers as we go to other parts of this section. Look at verse one. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things or marvellous things as my Bible says. I've got the old NIV. We praise God for what he has done. He is not just sitting up in his heaven in splendid isolation, leaving us to suffer down here. He is involved in human history, he cares, and he has revealed what he's like by both speaking and acting. So God's people praise him. We praise him because he planned everything from long ago. Nothing takes God by surprise. He had it all planned. He's in control. He's not making it up as he goes along like our government is and we ourselves are. He has a proper plan and that plan, the New Testament tells us, has from eternity centred on his son, the Lord Jesus, whose death and resurrection were not a setback and then a dramatic plan B, but were all part of the plan to save all his people. We praise him because he humbles the proud. He made the fortified city a heap of rubble, showing how useless for people to trust in their own resources 
and defences. That's verse 2. Therefore, verse 3, strong peoples will honour you, cities of ruthless nations will revere you, just as every knee shall bow before the Lord Jesus and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord in the end. The message of the cross of Jesus is described in 1 Corinthians 1 as a stumbling block to proud people. The cross of Jesus turns everything upside down and it's through that that God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Isaiah 25 verse 10 says God will bring down their pride despite the cleverness of their hands. God hates human pride. The mind boggles as to why any Christian would want to identify with a movement that calls itself pride. See the triumph of the humble over the proud in Isaiah 26 verse 5. He humbles those who dwell on high, he lays the lofty city low, he levels it to the ground and casts it down to the dust. Feet trample it down, the feet of the oppressed. The footsteps of the poor. Do you find that image resonates with what we've been seeing in the news over the last week or so? Statues topple and are cast down into the dust or into Bristol Harbour. Or 17 years ago, do you remember the statue of Saddam pulled down by US Marines in Baghdad, stamped on by the shoes of the people he had oppressed? I feel I should say something about all this statue toppling today. I expect you might agree with me in wanting to say something on both sides or else you might want to discuss it afterwards. Certainly the Black Lives Matter demonstrations have a point. I'm sure there has been unacknowledged racial prejudice and discrimination throughout our society that we need to work to root out and repent of. All human beings are made in the image of God and are of equal value. The transatlantic slave trade was a horrendous evil and we should be grateful for Christians like Wilberforce and shine a light on the blind spot that allows someone like Edward Colston to be so honoured. Seeing pictures of that statue coming down felt like a wrong being righted and yet it was in the wrong way wasn't it? It should have happened sooner through due process. With my limited knowledge I'm of the opinion that the police were probably wise not to intervene once they found themselves in that situation which seems to me intervention would have turned heavy-handed and stoked up more violence but on the other hand, we need law and order to be maintained and protesters must not take the law into their own hands with all the other statues commemorating heroes whose flaws may or may not be serious enough to outweigh the good being celebrated. These things need to be discussed calmly and appropriate action taken legally to ensure that what we are celebrating and commemorating is the good that people have done and not the evil. And we need to take care not to airbrush these wrongs out of our history as we take care not to glory in them. God humbles the proud and praise him that he keeps the poor and needy safe. Verse 4, you've been a refuge for the poor, a refuge for the needy in their distress a shelter from the storm and a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a storm driving against a wall, and like the heat of the desert. You silence the uproar of foreigners. As heat is reduced by the shadow of a cloud, so the song of the ruthless is stilled. In our climate, we don't often experience the sun going in as such relief, but we know what he means. It's God himself who is 
the refuge. Not here the strong walled city of Jerusalem, even though Zion so often repent, represents God's protection. That's something worth remembering when we can't go into our lovely old stone church to pray. It's not those stones that hear our prayers, it's the omnipresent Lord. He's with you on, on your sofa there in your pyjamas. He can see you. He'll protect you if you turn to him. And praise God that he will provide a great feast for all peoples. When we were reading Matthew's Gospel in church last year, we looked back to this verse in Isaiah when we saw how Jesus feeding the 5,000 hinted at the fulfilment of this prophecy. On, the mountain of the, on this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. Maybe we see it in Jesus changing water into wine as well. But it's when he fed the 4,000 in a Gentile area that this is most relevant because it's for all peoples, not just the Jews, not just Israel. And it should go without saying, of course, not just white people. There's, this is, is strong impetus for us to oppose all racism. Here's a picture um, of the uh, black front coming a picture taken last weekend end of last week from Bath Zone Black Lives Matter rally. There's a, a Christian in the foreground holding up a Bible because the message of the scriptures is of God's love for all peoples. Black lives matter to God. Our society's Christian roots demand that we value people from all ethnic backgrounds equally. The food isn't all that Isaiah is pointing forward to with his long range vision. Praise God that he will destroy death. Look at verse seven. And if you're feeling afraid of death, take this to heart. If you've lost a loved one, to that great enemy, death. Hear this promise from our promise keeping God. If the, the tears keep coming and you've got problems in this life that don't look as though they're going to go away in this life, look at verse seven and verse eight. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers the nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. People sometimes observe quite rightly that in God's unfolding revelation of himself in all the scriptures, even though the Old Testament is consistent with the new, it's very different because it's focused on this world, whereas the New Testament has eternity and the age to come much more in focus. But there are various hints throughout the Old Testament that even though people's view is mainly limited to this life, Old Covenant believers had an idea that this was not all there is to life. And here in Isaiah is possibly the clearest refer reference to resurrection in the whole Old Testament. Here in Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19 but your dead will live, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning, the earth will give birth to her dead. And we know how the fulfillment of that comes. Jesus pulled a few people back from the grave and he said to Lazarus' his sister, I am the resurrection and the life. When Jesus died, 
Matthew tells us at that moment the earth shook, the rocks split and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. These people must have ended up back in their graves again afterwards, but not forever. Because Jesus rose on that Sunday never to die again, because those events 700 years after Isaiah and 2000 years before us point us forward to the complete fulfillment of this prophecy when death is finally destroyed and the Lord ultimately wipes away every tear when you and I and countless others will join in the great song in that day with no fear of passing on any virus as we throw back our heads and sing at the top of our voices surely this is our God we trusted in him and he saved us this is the Lord we trusted in him let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation let's pray father God you are our God we are so uplifted when we we're so uplifted to have you as our God you do marvelous things and we're proud of you as our God we want to tell the world of the wonderful things you've done you have defeated death through the death of your son we want to sing about it to rejoice and be glad in your salvation we can't be proud of ourselves only of you because we didn't do anything to save ourselves. We just trusted you and you saved us. You delight to save those who trust you. So keep us in the faith, keep us trusting you. When we feel afraid and our faith wobbles, help us look to you and know that you're strong. You do marvelous things. Keep us relying on you and keep us looking beyond the struggles of this life looking forward to that great banquet with the best meat and the finest wine together with all your people from every race when we will be with you forever. Amen.